Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. So welcome back. Um, we'd like to continue on uh, with the discussion of Schrodinger's equation, and uh, this lecture is actually divided into two parts. So the first part is going to be a discussion of, of some important results that we, we didn't include in the last lecture. The second part of the lecture is uh, an extension. Uh, it's a, actually a discussion of a free particle and the quantum mechanical wave function for a free particle and what Schrodinger's equation predicts for the energies of those of a, of a free particle of ASM. So a two-part lecture. Uh, first part is basically a, a recap of what we've already discussed. Uh, these results are so important that it's, uh, it's really important, uh, it's critical for you to understand this differential equation uh, because we're going to deal with it time and time again throughout the semester. Uh, what, uh, what we did last lecture was we had two uh, differential equations. One is referred to as the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. That's the top equation here. As you can see it's got a time derivative uh, associated with it. Much simpler form is the time-independent form of Schrodinger's wave equation. This is usually uh, the, the equation that we, we will, will focus on in this course because we're not going to have a lot of potentials u of x that vary with time. So if u of x does not vary with time, then the time dependence of the wave functions are not so important. And you can then rewrite the time-dependent wave equation in terms of the time independent wave equation by simply just taking the derivative of psi with respect to t. It's useful to talk about physical constraints on this wave function, right? And, and at this point in the course, the wave function should be somewhat mysterious to you because we really haven't talked about it in any, any great detail. We, we just said it's a solution to Schrodinger's equation. We haven't given you a physical interpretation for it. And we're going to start uh, start with that physical interpretation right now. Uh, so the first point is, uh, are there any constraints on this wave function psi? And there are a few, right? Um, so one constraint is that you'd like to believe that the wave function is localized to a region of space such that is the, uh, the spatial uh, coordinate x goes to infinity the wave function should die out and also go to infinity. We don't like to solve problems where there are particles out at infinity, and uh, one way to ensure that is to make this wave function go to uh, zero as x gets large without bound. Uh, the other uh, two constraints on psi are that the wave function and its first derivative have to be continuous at all, all uh, valid uh, regions in x. And the reason for that is that it's, it's really quite simple, right? Because uh, this, is, this is an equation that basically says the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to the total energy. And if there's a discontinuity in psi or in the derivative of psi, then this term here will blow up. Okay? When you take the, the first derivative with respect to x of a wave function that has a discontinuity uh, in, the, in its value at some x, then you're going to pick up an infinity, and that infinity is going to show up in this equation. So if you don't like infinite energies, that implies that the wave function and its first derivative must be continuous uh, functions of x. Okay, so those, those are three constraints that, that uh, we can, physical constraints, we can uh, immediately apply to this wave function psi. The other uh, discussion of psi is, is a little bit more involved because it's not clear uh, what it represents, or it wasn't clear what it represented after Schrodinger wrote down this wave equation. Uh, clearly, psi can't represent anything real because it's got this complex character to it. It's got a real part and an imaginary part, and everything in our world is real, so uh, uh, psi can't represent anything that, that we can measure. And uh, actually, it was uh, a German scientist by the name of Max Born who suggested that 
it's the square of the wave function that is the quantity that is physically measurable. And uh, Born postulated the, the probability that you find a particle between x minus dx over 2 and x plus x, x plus dx over 2. So if you have a region of space and the separation in this region of space is a quantity dx, right, the probability that you find the particle in that region of space dx according to form was the, the square of the weight function times the length dx of the region of space that that you're interested in, right? So if, if you have a, a very narrow region in space and you know what the wave function is in that very narrow region of space, then all you can predict from the wave function is the probability that you'll find a particle in that region of space. If delta x, the separation in that region of space increases, then what you have to do is you have to evaluate the wave function over that new, uh, new uh, region delta x in order to find the probability that the particle will be confined in this larger region of space. So <laughs> this idea has survived. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the accepted interpretation of psi. And to reiterate, psi itself doesn't represent any, anything real. It's the square of the wave function that allows you to predict the probability of finding a particle in a certain region of space. And after all, psi is, is a wave function. It's describing the behavior of this de Broglie wave, right? So uh, uh, this idea of probability and waves are, are, are very uh, intimately tied together uh, by this definition that, that uh, Born came up with. So uh, because psi is a complex number, right? This quantity psi squared is really psi star psi, and so you'll see it, it, this is synonymous. These two things are written uh, in different books in different ways, but they mean exactly the same thing. And um, we also uh, like to define something called the probability density. Right? The probability density is just the limit. As delta x goes to zero, the probability that you find the particle divided by the region in space over which that particle is being localized. And so this probability density is just psi star psi, right? And it does not involve this quantity dx anymore. So when we start to talk about probability densities at a particular point in space, what, we, what we're saying is evaluate psi star psi at that particular point in space. So those are words, those are nomenclatures, uh, vocabulary uh, that, that we use. And um, uh, I just have to remind you that this, this idea of taking a complex conjugate of a, a wave function and multiplying it by itself involves some arithmetic that has to be really crystal clear at this point. So again, uh, you know, the magnitude of the wave function, psi squared, is the, is the complex conjugate of psi times psi. It doesn't matter whether uh, you take the complex conjugate and multiply it uh, at the end or at the beginning, right? The, the answer is the same. Uh, the important thing is it's the arithmetic that follows, right? And uh, so you have to uh, you have to basically take the real part of the wave function and square it and add it to the imaginary part of the wave function squared in order to get this probability density that we defined on the previous slide. So if that arithmetic is not, uh, if you haven't covered that in previous classes, uh, you really have to learn about it uh, uh, very quickly because we're going to rely on it extensively throughout the remainder of the course. So the second part of this lecture involves the discussion of four very important examples. Um, we're only going to discuss the free particle in the remainder of this lecture. The next three lectures in the course will, will involve a discussion of the infinite square well, the finite square well, and the simple harmonic oscillator. So these are four standard problems in quantum mechanics. They're basically covered in any textbook that you read, and it's really important for you to know uh, the solution of these uh, problems inside and out. So the arithmetic is not terribly uh, complicated. 
but the results of these four problems are used all the time in discussions uh, throughout the, the literature, and so it's really important that you, uh, you focus on these four examples and really understand what's going on. Uh, so with that warning, um, let, me, uh, let me discuss the free particle and let me solve Schrodinger's equation for a particle that's free to move in space. Okay? So, what we have is we have a particle of mass m. We're going to say that that particle of mass m is described by this wave function psi. We're going to confine the particle to move in one dimension. And we're going to say that the wave function psi uh, has to solve, satisfy Schrodinger's equation written down in one dimension. Okay. We're further going to say that the wave function psi is comprised of two, uh, is a product wave function. The product wave function involves a function only of x and a function only of uh, time t. Right? And this, this time dependent part of the wave function is often written in two ways. It's either written in terms of the total energy e of the particle or in terms of the, of the, free, of the uh, angular frequency omega that the particle has. Uh, we're not so much interested in the time dependent uh, part uh, of this uh, of Schrodinger's equation. Uh, so if we take the time that we take the derivative of the time dependent part and uh, that cancels out the time dependent part completely drops out and we're then left with this time independent equation that we need to solve. And what we have to do is we have to satisfy, we have to specify what the, the uh, potential is for a free particle. And the answer to that question is, uh, if a particle is free to move in the x direction, the potential that it feels is a constant independent of position. So what we have is we have a, a straight line, a constant potential, which we call u dot. So no matter where the particle is at along the x-axis, it has the same energy E, and then it feels the same uh, potential uh, U0. And, and with this approximation for U of X, this is called the free particle approximation, <coughs> Schrodinger's equation uh, can then be written in this standard form, which says the second derivative of the spatial dependent, uh, spatially dependent part of the wave function, the second derivative with respect to X is equal to minus 2m h bar squared e minus u naught times psi. Right? So this is a standard eigenvalue problem because psi appears on the right, psi also appears on the left. The operation of the second derivative then just gives you this energy eigenvalue, minus 2m over h bar squared e minus u naught. So what is e minus u naught? Well, classically, e minus u naught is going to be the kinetic energy of the, of the, of the particle. Right? That's, that's the kinetic energy of the particle that, that we're going to describe. So what are possible solutions of psi for, that, uh, for this differential equation? Right? How, how will we solve this differential equation? Come up with a, uh, a formula for psi. Well, if, depending on which textbook you read, you'll find a couple different solutions, and I like to go through that and try and explain uh, why you sometimes see one solution versus the other, right? So the obvious solution is psi is a linear, uh, linear combination of a sine and a cosine wave, right? So this is the spatial part of the wave function that satisfies that differential equation on the previous slide. If you want to write down the full time-dependent wave function, you then have to multiply the spatial part by this e to the minus i e over t over h bar, right? So this is a time dependent part of the, uh, the, the wave, uh, wave function. Now, the thing about quantum mechanics is that this wave function, the spatial part of the wave function could be complex, right? And that just simply means that since sine and cosine is written are real, that just simply means that A and B could be complex numbers. They could have real and imaginary parts. And so what you can show is you can show that this, this wave function, which is the sum of uh, two exponentials, e to the i plus, plus i kx, 
plus d e to the minus i k x. This solution is exactly equivalent to this solution here. I worked that out in the bottom part of this slide. It's a few lines of algebra, right? And, and so part of the confusion when you try to learn quantum mechanics is you pick up one textbook and you see this solution written. You pick up another textbook and you see this solution written and you say to yourself, oh my gosh, those are two separate functions. What's going on here? Well, they're not separate. They're, they're just re rewriting the same function in two different ways. So I always like to tell people it's just the same thing we do with fractions and, and, uh, and decimals and percentages in arithmetic. So for instance, if I have a quantity 3 over 8, that's equal to 0.375, and if I write that in terms of percentages, it's 37.5%. Right? All those three things mean the same thing, and depending on which, which form that I use for, for 3 a's, 0.375, or 37.5%, uh, which, which way I use it depends on the context. And so it's the same way in, uh, in quantum, right? You can, you can have the same function written down two different ways. They look completely different, but with just a little bit of algebra, you can show that they're exactly the same. Okay? So uh, <clears throat> that's a point that I always like to make because I, I, I hope it clears up some confusion that... Uh, that, that uh, uh, you may experience as you, as you work through some of these ideas on your own. Um, what does this wave function look like? That's a very, very interesting question. It's a very challenging question to visualize uh, this wave function. Right? So to, to do that, uh, let, me, let me work with this form here. Right? Uh, let me up front say that uh, this, this this wave function has a positive buoyant x value, uh, positive buoyant x component and a negative buoyant x component. So it involves waves that are moving uh, in positive x and waves that are moving in negative x. And for the for the time being, I set d equal to zero. Right? Then I have a wave function that just describes a a free particle moving in the positive x direction. So let me focus on that to begin with. Right? And if I write that wave function down, uh, uh, what I end up with is a, a picture that looks like a helical spring. Right? Uh, and again, you have to realize that there are three axes in this, in this diagram. Right? There's the real axis where I plot the real part of the wave function. There's the imaginary axis where I plot the imaginary part of the wave function. And then there's the x-axis, which tells me where this particle is located as I move through space. So if I define x equal to 0 to be at this point, then at some finite value x equal to x naught, this wave function right here okay, uh, is going to be represented by an arrow that's confined to this helical spring. And at this point, x equal to x naught is going to be a real part, an imaginary part of that wave function. Okay. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what the wave function looks like, right? Um, so for instance, uh, the picture here, I could assume that t is some fixed value, right? So let pick t equal to 0 to be a simple value. So t equal to 0. And, and at x equal to x naught, the, the wave function would be represented by this red arrow. If I go to some other value of x, the same value of t equal to 0, then the, the wave function is going to be whatever the, the helical spiral is at that particular point in x. So you have to have some mathematical uh, or geometric sense of what this wave function is trying to represent if you really truly want to understand what this uh, very simple form. I mean, this is an incredibly simple form for a wave function, but to interpret it requires uh, some some geometrical dexterity. The next slide, I think, I just go through and explain why uh, this value, uh, uh, why the wave wave function has a minus omega t associated with it. Right? The minus omega t just guarantees that as time progresses. The way this this particular form of the wave function moves in the positive x direction. So if you want a wave, uh, 
Um, if you want a wave function that moves in a positive x direction as t increases, then you need to include that minus omega t in the phase of the wave function. So I, I just, just try to make that point uh, clear. Um, what are the allowed energies for this, this particle wave, okay, this so-called the Broglie wave? Well, the allowed energies are going to come from solving this eigenvalue problem with the known wave function psi that, that we've just been discussing. So, for instance, again, if I uh, specialize the wave function so that it's moving in the positive x direction, and I'm not worried about the time dependence anymore because that's dropped out, right? Uh, then it's very simple to take the second derivative of this with respect to x, and ends up as being minus kx squared times the wave function psi again. So this is the eigenvalue problem. Right? These, these exponentials, these complex exponentials are just marvelous because it's so easy to take derivatives. Right? And so this differential equation with this solution for the wave function gives this equation that specifies the energy E of a particle. This is now the total energy E that the particle has. And this quantity E minus U naught is just going to be the kinetic energy that the particle has. Okay? So uh, this is very telling. This simple result is very telling because, first of all, there's no restrictions on K sub X or on E. If you tell me what U naught is, U naught is the constant background potential that this particle feels, right? And then you, and then I, uh, you allow me to specify a certain energy total energy for the particle E, then this quantity E minus U naught is known, right? Once E minus U naught is known, then I can solve this equation for K sub X. This is the wave vector, right? H bar K sub X is basically the momentum of the particle, right? And so, you, you know, the only thing I got to specify here is the mass of the particle M, and that mass could be anything. It could be the mass of an electron, it could be the mass of a proton, it could be the mass of a neutron doesn't matter. Uh, as long as the particle is free, you put in the parameters, you're going to get uh, no restrictions on either E or K sub X. Right? And this is a characteristic solution for a free particle in space. Right? Now the only thing that we haven't discussed yet is what the value for this constant, this multiplicative constant C is. Right? How are we going to determine that? Well, we need some other restriction. Uh, uh, to, uh, to define that, that parameter C. And uh, what, we, what we do is we refer back to the probability of finding the particle at some point along the x-axis. So to, find, to define the probability density that we find the particle at a particular point x at a particular time t, what we have to do is we have to calculate the psi psi star. And uh, it's, again, trivial to see that that's just equal to C times C star. And this quantity here is now independent of X and T. There's no, there's no time dependence in this. There's no spatial dependence in it. And it just simply means that this quantity C star C is going to tell us where the probability density is of finding that particle at any point along the X axis. So for instance, if I specify a distance delta X, Right? And I multiply delta x times this quantity C star C. That tells me the probability that I'll find that particle within that region of space, uh, delta x. So that's the interpretation of C for a free particle. It's that overall multiplicative constant. And it basically is telling you what the probability is of finding the particle uh, along some point in the uh, x direction. So this ends our discussion of the free particle. Um, it's the simplest uh, quantum mechanical problem you can solve. Uh, the next lecture, we're going to talk about confining particles to regions in space by infinite barriers. And so come back and we'll, uh, we'll discuss that problem in, in, in more detail and show that uh, a lot of these assumptions, a lot of these results that obtain for the free particle, right, those results break down when you start to confine a particle in space. So thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you next lecture.